This military court convened by order of the War Department is now in session. The lieutenant in charge is advised to post additional guards in the corridor. A lane is to be kept open at all times to the courtroom doors. Yes, sir. I take it all concerned with these proceedings have signed the necessary oath of allegiance to the government of the United States. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Colonel N.P. Chipman for the War Department. Mr. Otis Baker for the defense. The defendant, Henry Wirtz, is to be tried by this military commission, consisting of General Marx, General Thomas, General Geary, General Fessenden, General Ballier, Colonel Alcock, Colonel Stibbs, and myself, General Wallace. <coughs> Has the defense any objection to any of its members? No objection. Well... I don't see the defendant. The court, please. Uh, Captain Williams is here. We'll explain his absence. Sir, regarding the defendant, he will be here shortly. Is he ill? No, sir. He is temporarily indisposed following his attempt on his own life early this morning, which was quickly foiled by the alertness of the guard, sir. Mr. Wirtz attempted to take his life? Unsuccessfully, sir. Captain, you will explain to this court how such an attempt could have possibly occurred. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Wirtz tried to slash his wrist after breaking a bottle. A bottle? Yes, sir, a brandy bottle, which he receives daily as a stimulant by order of Dr. Ford. This incident should not have happened. You are charged with custody of the prisoner. You will take necessary steps to see it does not happen again. Yes, sir. However, you say the prisoner is in condition to appear shortly. Yes, sir, in a few minutes, and I will personally escort him to this court. Thank you, that'll be all. Yes, sir. I will now ask defense counsel to plead to the indictment in the absence of the defendant. We would prefer if the court will permit that Captain Wirtz hear the charges against him directly. This trial has been postponed several times. The court intends to proceed without further delay. Will counsel plead to the charge? Counsel will plead. If the judge advocate is ready, ready sir. the indictment will be read. Yes, sir. Charge criminal conspiracy to destroy the lives of soldiers of the United States in violation of the laws and customs of war. Specification that Henry Wirtz, who was in charge of the Confederate prison at Andersonville, Georgia, did keep in barbarously close confinement federal soldiers up to the number of 40,000 without adequate shelter against the burning heat of summer or the cold of winter. And specification that said Henry Wirtz, and carrying out this conspiracy did not provide the prisoners of war with sufficient food, clothing, or medical care, causing them to languish and die to the number of more than 14,000. Specification that he established a line known as the deadline, that he instructed the prison guards stationed on the walls of the prison stockade to fire upon and kill any prisoner who might pass beyond that deadline. Specification that he used bloodhounds to hunt down, seize, and mangle escaping prisoners of war and through these various causes, bringing about the deaths of about 50 federal soldiers, their names unknown. Specification, that through direct order and or by his own hand, brought about the murder of 13 prisoners, their names unknown. Mr. Baker, pleading for the prisoner, how do you plead to the charge? We interpose a motion that this military court discharge itself as being without proper jurisdiction now that the war is over. This court has jurisdiction under the war powers of the president, which are still in force. It is well known that diehard rebel officers still refuse to lay down their arms officially, and in fact, the war continues. Move to deny. Motion is denied. Motion to postpone. On the grounds of potential witnesses who in more normal time might speak for the defendant, refuse to do so for fear of their being misunderstood as signifying support for the late Confederacy. If Mr. Baker's witnesses can in good conscience sign the oath of loyalty to the government of the United States, they have nothing to fear. The court is aware of the temper of the times. It has only been four short months since Mr. Lincoln was assassinated. Mr. Baker, you will leave that name out of this trial. Nevertheless, Mr. Lincoln's presence is felt in this room and his murder is felt in this room and it swells the charge of murder against the defendant to gigantic size. For which the Southern cause is responsible. Defense counsel will not turn Mr. Lincoln's tragic death to his advantage here. My general concern, sir, is that the indictment leaves out Captain Wirtz's military superiors, making him the single target of the national mood of vengeance against the South. 
That will be all, Mr. Baker. The motion is denied. Now, if you have no further motion... I do. As the specifications alleging the charge of murder and abetting murder against certain persons move to strike them. Since no persons are named. Counsel cannot with his motions dispose of the horror of 14,000 unknown dead dumped into unmarked graves at Andersonville. Better records were kept of bales of cotton moved to deny. Will the judge advocate tell us where accurate prison records were kept during the war? The judge advocate owes me common courtesy here. A person accused of crimes punishable by death is entitled to a proper defense. We know what is being defended here. Counsel's political motives are well understood. This exchange will stop. I only remind the judge advocate that he is now in a court of law and no longer on the battlefield. He behaves as if the horror of war was not universal. The North had its Andersonvilles. The government of the United States is not on trial here, Mr. Baker. Well, that remains to be seen. Mr. Baker... I'm meaning no offense to the court. That remark stated in full would have been that remains to be seen. Through the testimony that will be offered here, I was referring to what the record will show, sir. The court is not misled, Mr. Baker. In the future, you will exercise care in your remarks to this court. The motion is denied. Prisoner to the court. If you have no further motions, I will order the defendant to plead to the charge. No further motions, but if it please the court, we have made a special request of the judge advocate on behalf of the defendant, which he has apparently forgotten. It has been requested that the defendant be allowed to recline on a sofa during the proceedings on his claim of great pain and weakness due to a so-called war wound. Not so-called, Colonel. I was a soldier in the line. I was honorably wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines. The defendant is not the only man in this room to bear the scars of war. I will not be slandered. Permission is granted for the prisoner to recline during the proceedings, and he will now plead. I thank you, Governor. I would like to make a statement, sir, as... You will be given an opportunity to do so, Mr. Wirtz. As to my attempt on my own life this morning, if the court is interested... Very well, make your statement. It was not guilt of conscience that drove me to that act. I have no guilt of conscience, none whatsoever. But that's all you have to say, Mr. Wirtz. A few words more, sir. I calmly sized up the situation as a soldier, as I see it... I have simply no chance whatsoever. And I decided not to give the government That'll the satisfaction That'll be all, of... Mr. Wirtz. One of the matters, sir. That will be all. Then the court will not permit me to mention a personal matter which should be of concern to this court. Very well. What is it? I write letters to my family, and I do not know if they are received. The court has nothing to do with the mails, Mr. Words. Possibly your letters are delayed. After all, conditions are still unsettled. General, I was taken from the midst of my family without warning and under the eyes of my children arrested. I do not care what the newspapers call me. Let them call me the Butcher of Andersonville. But what my children pick up, Father, that is important to me. I have the right to present myself to my children as I wish. I have the right. It is a cruelty that I do not know if my letters are received. If you wish, Mr. Wirtz, we will see to it that your letters go to your home by military packet. I thank the court most kindly. Really. They have been most considerate of me. The medical care, the spiritual comfort of the priest who is permitted to visit me daily in my cell. The court has been most time. <laughs> All that is wanted of me is my life. I am the fool! Will the court make you allowance for the strain that the defendant is obviously under? The defense counsel must share guilt with the prisoner for that outburst. Everything is conspiracy in the eyes of the judge advocate. I am not here to make your case so much as you would like. I would like you to be And I would like to remind you that normal courtroom behavior... That is normal, That yes. normal courtroom behavior calls for the outward appearance. I don't care what you think, that one's opponent is acting in good faith. Which I cannot assume, sir, since I know where you stand. And where is that, Colonel? The side of those who secretly oppose this government, the notice fighting for its life. Who pays you here? Not the government. No, not this government. But the remnants of that other, still active. The judge advocate is suspicious of my politics and wants to know who pays me if the court will permit. I will oblige the judge advocate. I am paid by a committee formed to defend Captain Wirtz. 
I take my cases where I find them subject to one condition, that I must feel that there's a shade, the smallest shade of doubt as to a man's guilt. Regarding my politics, in my home city of Baltimore, a city of divided loyalties, some held that I was an enemy to the Confederate side because I felt that slavery was not worth dying for, since it is an unworkable institution doomed for extinction anyway. And then there were, there were the others who, who suspected me of, of being lukewarm as to the glorious future that would follow a northern victory. <laughs> the colonel might make his own position clearer. It was natural for me to go to war against a cause that wished to perpetuate human bondage, and I am here in the service of the Union, seeking justice for those men barbarously murdered by that Southern cause. I am personally involved here, Mr. Baker, if you are not. As a lawyer, as a clerk, under orders to process word through to the hangman. <laughs> as I thought, we can make the full charge. Well, I take it gentlemen are through. Under military law, we could, of course, dispense with defense counsel. The defendant would not have to be present. And this case could be heard in a small room. But the government has seen fit to set it here in a court of claims and before an audience. Conceding the temper of the times and the emotions of all parties, we intend to hold this trial within bounds. I do not further advise the testing of the power of this court to maintain order. Now, the defense counsel has stated he has no further motions. I will now order the defendant to plead to the charge. Prisoner, how do you plead? The prisoner enters a plea of not guilty to the charge and to all specifications. The judge advocate may summon his first witness. General charge of criminal conspiracy, we summon Mr. D.T. Chan. D.T. Chan, huh? Baker, you have all the necessary documents. Yes. It's including the evidence that I allowed the youngest northern prisoners out on parole. You remember, I let them out to pick blackberries. I know, I know. But it will do no good. I must die. Yes, I must die. I do. The real crime I have committed here, Baker, you know what it is, of course. Well? That I chose the losing side. <laughs> Before we begin, we will state briefly the rule of evidence applying in cases of criminal conspiracy. The evidence of a common design is sufficient to convict. And we will prove that such a common design existed at Andersonville, to which the defendant willingly lent himself. Mr. Chandler, where were you employed in the year 1864? I served in the Army of the Confederacy. The rank of Lieutenant Colonel. What was your official function? I was assigned by the War Office to inspect and report on all of the military prisons maintained by the Confederacy. Were you at any time in the Andersonville military stockade at Sumter County, Georgia? Yes, sir. There had been civilian reports forwarded to Richmond. How long were you there? Two weeks. I asked you, Mr. Chandler, if this is a fair map of the Andersonville stockade. Yes, it is. Will you describe its dimensions, its area? On the long side, 1,000 feet from north to south, 800 feet from east to west, comprising an area of about 16 acres of ground. Uh, what was the nature of the terrain? Simply earth, bare ground. Was this the condition of the terrain in advance of it being a site for the camp? No, sir. It was originally part of a section of pine woods. And what can you tell us about the climate in that part of Georgia? I refer now to extremes of temperature, summer heat, winter cold. July and August, it can be quite hot, over 100 degrees. Winters, near freezing, rainy. And was this camp laid out with a provision for shelter of any kind? No, sir. Will you describe this outer stockade line? That was a wall some 15 to 20 feet high, made out of rough hewn timbers. And there was a platform run around the top of it. And there were sentry boxes at intervals. And this inner line? That was a line of posts, parallel to the outer line, about 25 feet inside of it. It had a name, did it not? The dead line, yes, sir. So-called because if a prisoner went beyond it, he could be shot by the guard. And this meandering line here? 
had to be the stream that ran through the camp. Entering under the west wall of the stockade, emerging under the east side wall. It's uh, width and depth. No more than a yard wide and a foot deep. Marshy areas around the stream. That marshy area could better be called a swamp, could it not? A swamp, yes, sir. Of what size? 150, 50 feet on, on either side of the stream. Having a considerable oozy depth, did it not? Person venturing to cross it might sink up to his waist. That would be the cookhouse, the burial yard, the dead house. That's the main entrance to the camp. Thank you, Mr. Chandler. Now, will you tell us something of the history of this camp? Will you state the circumstances under which it was established? Toward the latter part of 63, all of the military prisons maintained by the Confederacy were overcrowded. The War Office decided to create a new camp. And who was responsible for its establishment? General John H. Winder. Now deceased? Yes, sir. And what was his official function? General Winder was in charge of all of the military prisons for the Confederacy east of the Mississippi. You've stated that this site that the camp was located on was originally part, a, uh, part of a pine wood. The cutting down of every tree that could have provided shade. Was General Winder responsible for that? Yes, sir. So the site and the arrangements made for the care of the prisoners was known to and approved of by your war office. I don't know with what knowledge or approval. The colonel knows how a line of command works. Wasn't it their responsibility with, with, withdrawn for the time being? Will you describe conditions at Ansonville as you observed them, Mr. Chandler? When I visited the camp, uh, it was tightly crowded with men in the area. Giving each man how much space, would you say? Perhaps 36 square feet per prisoner. The space equivalent to a cell, six feet on each side. What else did you find at Andersonville? There was a general insufficiency of food, water, and shelter. I think that would cover it. I think not. When you say an insufficiency of water, you mean that the available water supply for all purposes, for drinking, cooking, washing, came from that narrow brook. Isn't that so? Yes, sir. And that stream at the same time was the repository for all waste matter. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. All waste matter from the camp was emptied into that stream. Hmm? Yes, sir. The waste from the cookhouse, the bodily waste of the prisoners. Yes. Turning that stream into a foul, sluggish sink, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And the foul, stinking stream was the total water supply for 40,000 men, and that is what you mean by an insufficiency of water, isn't that so, Mr. Chandler? Yes. And as for the insufficiency of shelter, there was, in fact, no shelter. The men lived on bare ground, winter and summer, or dug themselves into the ground, into burrows, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And as to the sort of clothing the men had, please be specific, sir. Some of the men wore shirts and trousers. Some? You mean the newly arrived prisoners still had their shirts and trousers? Yes, sir. The others, the vast number of them, were in rags. Isn't that correct, Mr. Chandler? Yes. You mean those men were in a state of nakedness, so near nakedness, under the terrible weather conditions you've just described. Isn't that correct, sir? Yes. And tell us about the food. Mostly cornmeal. Fine ground or coarse? Unbolted meal. Unbolted meal, meaning meal ground so coarse it was as good as swallowing a knife for what it did to a man's insides, considering the weakened condition those men were in. Isn't that uh, correct, Mr. Jack? Yes, sir. Did the men have any other sort of food besides the meal? A bit of meat now and then. What sort of meat? Not very good. Not very good. The soldiers had a joke about that meat, didn't they? A grim kind of soldier's joke to describe the, the meat that came from those sick and dying mules and horses. They told you that animal 
that meat came from. It had to be held up on its legs to be slaughtered. Isn't that correct? Jokes of that kind, yes, sir. And you saw with your own eyes that it was rotten, maggot-ridden meat, and that's what you mean when you say not very good. Isn't that correct, Mr. Chairman? Yes. The conditions the men lived under drove them to extreme measures in order to survive. Isn't that so? Extreme, yes, sir. To the point where they considered rats a delicacy. Isn't that correct? Yes. To the point where when one of them died, the others, uh, in the desperation they had been driven to, strip the body clean of whatever was on it in five minutes. Well, boots, trousers, if there was any, bread, greenbacks to bribe the guards, anything in order to keep alive. Isn't that correct, Mr. Chandler? Yes, sir. Driven in their desperation to the point of Cannibalism. Isn't that correct, Mr. Chairman? Yes. You were able to establish that for a fact in your mind, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. How? As, as delicately as you wish. On the condition of some of the bodies, some very rough surgery had been performed. So in that place, men had been driven to the disposition of beasts. Isn't that so, Mr. Chandler? Yes, sir. And if I were to sum up Andersonville as a, as a pit, an animal pit where men wallow the sick, the dying, the insane, wallowing among the dead, would I exaggerate a picture of that place, Mr. Chairman? No. Concerning what you saw there, you submitted a report with recommendations to General Winder and your war office. Yes, I did. Is that a copy of the report? This is the report. Submitted in evidence, you say in this report, that Andersonville is a plot on the Confederacy. You recommend that the prisoners be transferred to other prisons without delay and that Andersonville be closed down immediately. Yes, I did. Exhibit one for the government. And this report was ignored, was it not? Ignored, disregarded, the conditions allowed to remain. Colonel, I didn't come here to indict the leaders of the cause for which I fought as plotting the murder of defenseless men. Your report revealing how Winder and Wurtz we're operating that cap was ignored. I've told you, I could not endure Andersonville. But you people act as though you were better human beings than we were. No, but our cause was. Your report was ignored. Due to the crisis, the bitterness, the disorder, the General Sherman marching through Georgia, burning his way. Your report was ignored. As your officers would have ignored it too, sir, if it had been General Lee marching through Pennsylvania to New York. Chandler. difficult situation for me. Nevertheless, you will answer the question. The judge advocate will repeat the question and you will answer it. Mr. Chandler, your report on Andersonville was ignored, was it not? Yes, sir. Mr. Chandler, did General Winder ever express to you his disposition towards the men? Yes, sir. When I spoke with General Winder, he had hard and bitter feelings toward the men. How did he express those feelings? He finally said that if half of the men died, there'd be twice as much room for those that were left. <clears throat> the half that were slated for the grave were well on the way at Andersonville. Mr. Wirtz set up certain rules at the camp. Rules pertaining to the punishment of prisoners attempting to escape, did you not? Yes, sir. His command of the camp conforming to General Winder's inhuman disposition towards the men. I must ask the judge advocate what he means by that suggestive, ambiguous phrase, conforming to. Withdrawn. Wirtz's rules at Andersonville, were they rules violating the customs of war? Well, yes. In addition, were they cruel and inhuman rules? Yes, sir. Was worse the personal choice by General Winder for superintendent of that camp? Yes, sir. That'll be all. 
Colonel Chandler. You made a second report on Andersonville for the Confederate War Office, did you not? Yes, I did. Is this a copy of that report? That's the report. Submitted by the defense, entered in evidence. Exhibit number one for the defense. Colonel, in this report, which the judge advocate has failed to call attention, you recommend the dismissal of General Winder. Yes, I did. But not of Captain Woods. No, sir. Why not? The time I inspected Andersonville, there was nothing in Captain Wirtz's conduct of a malignant disposition toward the men that would justify my asking for his dismissal. I notice also in this report that you took various prisoners aside, urging them to speak freely as to any instance of ill treatment by Captain Wirtz and that they had no complaints on that score. No, sir. So that neither you nor the prisoners who were presumably being subjected to Captain Wirtz's cruel and inhuman treatment blamed him for it, did you? No, sir. No more questions, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chandler, very often, as you know, commanders are forewarned of inspection and dress up their command in advance. Couldn't this have occurred in your case? Perhaps. And isn't it possible that the prisoners would fear the consequences of complaints against words? The men did not know you. Words would still be there if you'd gone. Under the circumstances, isn't it possible that the men would not answer you truthfully? Possibly. I did the best I could with that answer. Yes, did Wirtz do the best he could under the circumstances? Despite Winder's orders, couldn't he have chosen to... There are ways, ways of doing what? Evading the orders of his military superiors? Now, what is the judge advocate suggesting? Withdrawn. Thank you, Mr. Chandler. That'll be all. If there are no other questions, the witness may stand down. The court thanks you, Colonel Chandler. We call Dr. John C. Bates. Dr. John C. Bates. We solemnly swear that the evidence that you shall give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you die. Dr. Bates, were you in the service of the Confederate Army in 1864? Yes, sir. Were you at any time inside the Andersonville Stockade? Yes, sir, for about eight months in 64. And what was your official function? Uh, as a medical officer assigned to the camp by the Surgeon General, I can't say I asked for it. Oh. I'm sure not. Describe your activities there as physician. Uh, writing prescriptions for drugs that were not available, uh, amputation of limbs due to gangrene, quite a lot of that. Certifying the dead in my section every morning, quite a lot of that, too. Did you at any time during your stay there make an estimate as to the rate of death in that place? Yes, I did, sir. Uh, I had always kept the uh, ledger book uh, covering the ailments and treatment of my patients in civilian life, or farmers, their families, uh, their horses, too. <laughs> <laughs> And I decided to keep some sort of a record of that camp because I was deeply shocked by that place when I came there. So will you please tell the court your estimate of the rate of death? Uh, during the spring months, uh, 50, 60, 70 men a day. During uh, periods of extreme heat during the summer, uh, reaching 100 men a day. Uh, more in uh, May than in April, more in June than in May. And during uh, July, August, and September, 3,000 men a month were dying. And what were the principal causes of that high rate of death? Oh, well, lack of sanitary facilities, lack of exercise, and the anemia of the men due to lack of food, rendering them subject to fatal illness from the slightest abrasion or infection. The uh, lack of medical supplies. Dr. Bates, in your professional opinion, of the thousands who died at Andersonville, how many would have lived if conditions had at least been sanitary? I would estimate uh, 75, 80 percent. 10 to 11,000 of those 14,000 men. Yes, sir. And can you think of any sanitary measures which, if taken at Andersonville, would have saved lives? Humber, yes, sir. Did any of you suggest these measures to uh, Mr. Wirtz? Yes, sir. Uh, myself, uh, probably others. And what did he say? He said I was a doctor and didn't understand his difficulties in running a huge camp like that. Uh, 
He was downright incoherent. He uh, damned me for a Yankee sympathizer, cursed me out in English, German, and some other foreign dialect. <laughs> French. That was French, Dr. Bates. French. <laughs> Keep in mind, Mr. Wirtz, that your situation here is not amusing. No, sir. <laughs> and I cannot explain it to myself or to the court why I have this feeling to laugh when I hear how I killed all the men. <laughs> Perhaps the court can explain it. <laughs> Do not play the clown here, sir. Continue, Colonel. Only one more question. On that not so humorous occasion, when you spoke to Wirtz and he complained to you of the difficulties of his job, did you understand him to mean difficult administratively or difficult humanly? Mr. Wirtz dwelt on his own difficulty, not to men. That'll be all. Now, Dr. Bates. Dr. Bates, you regard yourself as a fair-minded man, do you not, Doctor? I do. The fact that you dislike Captain Wirtz hasn't influenced your testimony in any way here, has it? No, it has not. But you did dislike him. Well, not so as to influence my uh, professional objective opinion. I now address myself to the professional, objective side of you, Doctor, and strictly to that side. So far as you know, by whose authority was the amount of food per prisoner decided on? Commissary General in Richmond, I believe. And not by Captain Woods. And by whose authority was the amount and type of medical supplies to the camp decided on? Surgeon General. And not by Captain Woods. He was responsible neither for the lack of food or the inadequate medical supplies? I would have to agree. You would have to agree. You don't want to agree, but you would have to agree. Is that what you mean, Doctor? You seem, seem to have found Captain Wirtz rather callous towards the, the condition of the prisoners, Doctor. This was my honest impression. Well, we're, we're all entitled to our honest impressions, Doctor. I seem to record your saying a few minutes ago how shocked you were at the high rate of death at Andersonville Prison when you came there. Deeply shocked. Well, one can understand how unnerving that would be, Doctor. That was in, in what month, by the way? In February. You had to face that unnerving scene day after day, month after month. Oh. It's difficult to understand how you could do that, Doctor. Well, sir, I had to steel myself. Gradually, the shock of it became bearable. I'm curious, Doctor. How gradually did your, your feeling of shock lessen? Well, for example, how, how did you react to the dying? Well, by June, let us say. Not as much. And by September? Even less. So that by September, when, as you said, 3,000 men per month were dying, you hardly reacted at all. I meant I had grown accustomed to seeing... Of course you had. Any human being to save his sanity would have to do that. So that Captain Wirtz's callousness in that place wasn't so strange after all, was it, Doctor? Well, my impression of Mr. Wirtz remains the same despite that. Thank you, Doctor. That'll be all. Uh, Dr. Baines. <clears throat> Do you recall one single instance in conversing with Wirtz? When he 
made any criticism of the orders or disposition of his superiors. Objection. Now, I find that a strange question to be asked by a counsel for the War Department, himself a soldier. Is it being held against Captain Wirtz that he did not make a public judgment of the motives of his military superiors? The court must agree Wirtz was not bound to comment on the orders of his military superiors. If it please the court, we're concerned here with the frame of mind of a man carrying out the inhuman design of his superiors. We are bound to explore his, his thinking when he obeyed those orders. His thinking when he obeyed those orders? And if he didn't like those orders, what was he supposed to do? Disobey them? If conscience is the measure by which a soldier obeys or disobeys, then we can hardly condemn the army officers who went over to the Confederacy since they did so on the ground of conscience. And on that ground of conscience, Robert E. Lee deserves a monument. That'll be all, Mr. Baker. I am certain it was not in the mind of the judge advocate to raise the issue of disobedience to a superior officer. Under certain circumstances, that issue may require consideration, sir. Well, Colonel, uh, the court of course, is not suggesting a line of inquiry the judge advocate is to take here. But the court will say it is disposed to draw its own inference as to a criminal design from evidence of the defendant's words and acts, and not from an examination of moral factors which can lead us into a bottomless pool of philosophic debate. I am certain the judge advocate will agree and that he will withdraw that question as to whether or not Wirtz criticized his superior officer. The order is withdrawn. <clears throat> Dr. Bates, you never grew so accustomed to that place as to forget your human obligations as men, did you? You made it your daily business to bring food to those starving men, didn't you? Of course. And there was plenty of food in the region of Andersonville to draw on if Wirtz had wished to bring it in. The yield of grain and vegetables in the region of Andersonville is considerable, isn't it? <laughs> is Dr. Bates put forward as qualified to testify on the agricultural situation? Withdrawn. If the court please, we'd like to change the order of witnesses. We'd like now to call a witness better qualified to speak with accuracy on the available food supply in the region of Andersonville. Uh, does defense counsel offer objection to a change in the government witnesses? Not at all. Yeah. We call Ambrose Spencer to the stand. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Bates. You may step down. Uh, we thank the witness. Thank you, Dr. Bates. Mrs. Spencer, where do you reside? I reside in the town of Americas in Sumter County. What is your occupation? I operate a plantation in that county. Uh, corn, uh, cotton, tobacco. Is that plantation uh, in the proximity to the Andersonville site? Uh, practically bordering. And you are in a position to know as well as any man the yield of grain and vegetables in the region of Andersonville? I would say so. What can you tell us of the yield in the years 1863 and 1864? Uh, both uh, good years. Uh, Sumter in the adjoining county, Macon, I may point out, a part of a very productive area, uh, sometimes turned the garden of the Confederacy. Uh, yes, yes. We, we will have some place. details as to the yield. Uh, corn averaged about eight bushels to the acre, wheat uh, six. Now, that's the general average, but we have land in Sumter producing as much as 35 bushels to the and acre. And the vegetables. Well, there was an uncommon amount during the war. Uh, since there was so little cotton planted, practically all the ground was put into provisions, you see. And if Mr. Wirtz had solicited food for the prisoners from the neighboring farms and plantations, what do you think would have happened? He would have gotten it. How can you be so certain of that? Uh, the proof, sir, is that without it being solicited, there were people in the vicinity who came forward and made an effort to get food into that camp. Uh, in one case, uh, group of women in America, said, including my wife, that made that attempt. Will you tell the court of that occasion? Well, sir, the ladies thought it would be the Christian thing to do, having heard that the prisoners were doing so poorly. Now, they obtained enough food through contributions to fill four wagons uh, and had uh, them driven uh, right... Uh, how large were the wagons? Oh, uh, four of the largest farm wagons we could find, uh, each requiring four to six horses to pull them. Making a, a load of how much food for the prisoners? Oh, maybe a uh, 20 ton. Please continue. They had those wagons driven right up to the gate of the stockade. Uh, Mr. Wirtz was at the gate when the ladies arrived. He would not permit the food to be brought in. He cursed those women. 
He told them they were giving aid and comfort to the enemy, that the Yankees were unlawfully invading and looting the South, and that those women were traitors. Uh, and worse. He used the violentest and profanest language I've ever heard in a man's mouth. He said that if he had his way, he would have a certain kind of a house built for those women, and he'd have them all put in there where Confederate soldiers would teach them a lesson in loyalty in a hurry, and teach to them in a way they wouldn't forget. <laughs> yes, yes, we understand the remark. Well, these women were turned away by Mr. Wirtz from giving food to starving men. Yes, sir, they were turned away, and, and they wept. And if Mr. Wirtz had solicited food on Christian grounds and on behalf of the good name of the Confederacy, you think that would have brought in large amounts I'm of food? I'm certain the people of Georgia would have responded, yes, sir. You knew the defendant, do you not? Oh, I knew him quite well. And you knew General Winder well? I knew him, too. Yes. What, from your knowledge, what can you tell us about General Winder's disposition towards the prisoners? Uh, when he came there once, Winder said that the Yankees had come south to take possession of the land, and he was endeavoring to satisfy them by giving them each a small plot, pointing to the grave site. Did you ever hear Wirtz express himself along similar lines? Well, I can tell you that he stated that he wished all those men in hell boasted that he was killing more Yankees at the Andersonville than Lee was at Richmond. Well, you heard those remarks? Yes, sir, to wipe out all those men. That, that was the scheme. That'll be all. It was my scheme, you said. To, to wipe out all those men. On my head, all those men. Mr. Wirtz. I was a man like, like other men. Mr. Baker, you will please restrain the defendants. Who, who will understand? An ordinary man, like me, Baker, you will God. please restrain the... No, my boys, I, I say that now I... Captain, <laughs> Captain, what? Hold on the brandy in the back. I ask for a postponement. Well, Dr. Ford. A fainting spell, General, from which he recovers. He's lacking in strength and suffers from strain, but uh, he should be able to continue, I suppose. We hope so. Mr. Baker, this trial must go on. If the court please. No use, Mr. Baker. Well, the open bias of the witness is a case in point. I need not remind this court of the bitterness in our time. It is no use, Mr. Baker. Even the sight of a tattered Confederate blouse has caused a riot in the streets. The very air is charged. We are not empowered to move this trial into the next century. This trial will continue. You will make it clear to the defendant that should there be another demonstration here in this courtroom, he will be tried in absentia. In absentia. Latin for absence. I understand all languages, but the language of this trial... This court has suffered sufficient provocation to send Captain Wirtz from the room, but I suggest that it does not. You suggest we do not? Since it is not he alone in this room who is stripped down to naked hatred and anger. You, counsel, will cross-examine or stand down. Counsel will cross-examine. Now, Mr. Spencer, you don't regard yourself as prejudiced against Captain Wirtz, do you? I don't. Then why is it that you have chosen to leave out of that touching tale about those women bringing food to that camp? The fact that General Winder was there at the time, it was he who ordered that food kept out. Why? Yes, why? You were there at the main gate of that camp together with those other civilians when you heard General Winder say loudly and emphatically that that food was not to be brought in. Now, Wirtz would not have tried. Answer the case. question. Why didn't you say so? Well, I wasn't asked. <laughs> You weren't asked. Motion to dismiss Mr. Spencer's testimony is irrelevant in that it offers nothing more than the fact that Captain Wirtz was carrying out a direct order. Move to deny. Will the judge advocate offer a ground for denial? Is he saying that Captain Wirtz should have defied those direct orders of General Winder's? Will you deny it was an inhuman order? Which he should have disobeyed? Defense motion is denied. Of course it's denied. It is now plain enough to know why the government has chosen to try Captain Wirtz on a conspiracy charge. On that charge, the accused may be convicted without any direct evidence against him. Mr. Baker... And if there is a conspiracy, it is one that is directed against Captain Wirtz. And I say now that the motives which bring Wirtz to trial here dishonor the government of the United States and contradicting its own military code, the army will have that man, despite the fact that he was doing his proper duty. Are you through, Mr. Baker? I am through. 
You have been in contempt since the beginning of that outburst. This court will consider a formal charge against you. You are dismissed from this proceeding forthwith, and you will immediately leave this room. Let Captain Wirtz be without counsel, so that this trial may be judged for what it is. Guards, escort Mr. Baker from the room. I, I appeal the court. I will have no counsel. <laughs> No counsel, it, it makes no difference. I respectfully request <laughs> the court. The court has borne the provocative behavior of defense counsel with the utmost patience. I urge that Mr. Baker be allowed to purge himself of contempt if he so wishes. I pray that the magnanimity of the court may extend itself so that not even in the wildest misrepresentation of this trial can it be said that that defendant was denied counsel of his choice. Mr. Baker, for the single reason that Mr. Wirtz may have counsel of his choice, you may purge yourself of contempt if you so wish. You may do so by recanting those remarks, impugning the integrity of the government and army of the United States, by apologizing to this court, and by giving us your solemn oath, such outburst will not occur again. I do so recount and apologize and give my oath that I will not hereafter impugn the fairness of this court or the motives of the government and the army of the United States. Thank you. The judge advocate... Colonel, are we through with this witness? Yes, sir, we are. Witness may step down. Call your next witness, Colonel. Yes, sir. On the specification that the defendant did keep in barbarously close confinement, Soldiers numbering at times 40,000 men, without adequate shelter from the rain and the heat of summer and the cold of winter. Mr. Davidson, Captain Wirtz knew the dogs tore and killed prisoners of war, didn't he? It's commonly known, yes, sir. Mr. Davidson, did you ever see a prisoner of war torn by dogs? I mean, on an occasion when Mr. Wirtz was present. Colonel Chipman. The court does not wish to exclude pertinent testimony, but we have heard a great number of former Andersonville prisoners the court, testify. Please recall only those witnesses we think necessary, and necessary, we necessary. cannot altogether control the amount of time required for a thorough examination. Yes, Colonel. Uh, does the judge advocate hope, as he stated yesterday, to conclude this afternoon? Yes, we will make every effort. Continue, Colonel. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davidson, the question is, did you ever see a prisoner of war torn by dogs with words pressed? Well, tell us about it, Mr. Davidson. I saw that after tunneling out of the stockade with another prisoner. Dogs treated. Guards ordered us down. Dogs tore my companion. And, and where was Wirtz? Rode up a minute after that pack of dogs were treated. Yelling. Get those Yankee bastards. I beg your pardon. And what was Wirtz doing while the dogs tore your companion? Damning him to hell. His eyes starting out of his head like a fit was on. Can you think of another instance? Colonel, the court repeats. It does not need to hear further evidence corroborating facts alleged many times over. Well, Captain Wirtz's presence on an occasion when the dogs not only uh, tore a prisoner of war, but actually killed him. Killed him yes. Uh, will the government conclude this afternoon? Yes, sir. The question, question is, Mr. Davidson, of an instance when the dogs not only tracked down a prisoner of war, but actually killed him. And, of course, with Captain Wirtz present. You hear my question, Mr. Davidson? Yes. Well? I don't like to talk about that place, Colonel. State the circumstances. It was this time a man from my prison squad escaped. 
But then we'd heard he'd been captured by the dog. But you actually saw him being brought back to the stockade? Yes, sir. First in the gates, Captain Wirtz on that big gray he rode. Then two guards with this man in between them. They was holding him up, letting him go once they was inside the gate. He fell down. His legs was tore, his throat laid open. Flesh torn about the legs and his neck bloody. Did he get up or did he just lie there? Made as if to get up and lay back. He didn't move after that. And where was Wirtz during all this? Right there. Right where? Like I said, he... We will hear it again, please, Mr. Davidson. Like I said, he rode in, the man fell down. Captain Wirtz rode around looking down at him, reining in his horse, which is skittering and rearing. That was a horse with a temper. And then he rode back out the gate. That'll be all. Mr. Davis, can we won't detain you long, sir. That first instance you described when you were making your escape attempt, you say that Captain Wirtz yelled, urging on those dogs that were tearing at your companion. Yes, sir. Mr. Davidson, any time in your career, have, have you ever yelled, get those rebel bastards? I guess so. What was it that Captain Wirtz yelled? Get those yank. But that was different. How different? Well, he meant for those dogs to tear that man. I saw them do that. You were close enough to see that. Yes, sir. Well, how close would you say, Mr. Davidson? 10, 15, 15 feet away, maybe. No more than from here to there. Well, now, how can you say, Mr. Davidson, that those dogs, those ferocious dogs, didn't attack you? Can you count for that? Can you think of any reason, Mr. Davidson? I wouldn't know why, sir. Well, now, since you admit that those ferocious dogs did not attack you, shall I understand that you were completely unhurt when you were brought back to the camp? Oh, no, sir. Well, you were bruised some as a result of rushing pell-mell through those swamps, weren't you? Yes, sir. Bloodied a bit, too? From all that... Running and stumbling against rocks, yes, sir. Yes, and from those bramble bushes and those whipping branches and those dead cypress trees, some of them pointed as knives. Yes, sir. Well, that would bruise and bloody any man trying to beat a pursuit through a Georgia swamp, wouldn't it? I guess so. So in that second instance you spoke of, when you saw that man brought back to the stockade and you saw those marks on him, which you say were caused by dogs, couldn't they have been caused by his rushing headlong through that swamp as yours were? That man was torn by dogs. Oh, now, Mr. Davidson, you didn't see him being torn by dogs, did you? It was commonly known, those... Oh, many things are commonly known, sir. Could you identify the marks on that man as being indisputably caused by dogs? He was bit by the dogs and he died. Possibly. How long did you remain at that spot after that man? You don't know his name, do you, Mr. Davidson? No, sir. Well, how long did you remain there after that man fell down? Three, five minutes. And did you have an occasion to look back that way later on? Uh... Sometime later, yes. Was he still lying there? No. No, he's taken off to the dead house. Or to the sick ward. Mr. 
gave it to me. You can't really say for sure that that man died as a result of being mutilated by dogs, and, and you can identify him, isn't that correct? Sir? Please? I gotta go back home. Captain Wirtz riding around that man with, without a word? That sounds mighty unfeeling. You wouldn't happen to know if Captain Wirtz notified the guard at the gate to have that man moved, would you? I gotta go home, sir. No more questions. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Davidson. Captain Wirtz openly showed his contempt and hatred of the, those men brought back, didn't he? Those men torn and, 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 and killed by those dogs. I don't know. You don't know? Captain Wirtz coldly sitting his horse, indifferent to that man brought back to die? I can't say for sure how he felt. But those were marks of teeth and claws you identified on his body, weren't they? I guess so. Well, you were quite sure of that. At one time, you also said that he died, that he lay there. The, the flies set on his face. He made no move to, to brush them off. I, uh... And Captain Wirtz, looking on, looking on, that dying man. I don't remember. Well, all I'm asking you to repeat is what you've already sworn to under oath, Mr. Davidson, that his attitude was monstrously cold and indifferent to those dying men. Let me be, Colonel, please. Mr. Davidson, I warn you. I... I've got to forget that place. Or has it been suggested that you forget that place? Colonel Chipman. I think the witness is through. Are you now ill, Mr. Davidson? Yes. I've got pains. And you've told us about the incident as well as you can now recall it. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How old are you, Mr. Davidson? Nineteen, sir. I believe you said you fought with the 2nd Vermont Cavalry. 2nd Vermont Cavalry? Yes, sir. We turned their flanks many times. Well, you may now go home, Mr. Davidson, and this court wishes you Godspeed in recovering good health and and in forgetting what you've endured in war and in prison. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Could be, uh, could be those dogs didn't tear me for the same reason Daniel wasn't torn in the lion's den. There was many died in that place. Many died. I heard dogs baying at night. I hear voices cry out, help. Help.
no one to help. Many died. Many, many died. Mr. I apologize to the witness. Yes, sir. Well, gentlemen, the weather continues hot, and we've been at this trial longer than anticipated. So I will <coughs> ascribe tempest to the heat. You may call your next witness, Colonel. Joseph H.F. to the stand. Is Mr. H.F. called to testify on the specification that dogs attacked escaping prisoners? Yes, sir. The court refuses to hear further testimony on that specification. It's unnecessary. Court, so please, call please. your next witness, Colonel. The final witness on the specification that the defendant caused the death of prisoners by direct order, we call Jasper Culver to the stand. Jasper Culver. Who next? Hardy. <laughs> Baker will roast Hardy and throw him back to me. Well done. I won't roast Gray. I won't put him I do. He's eyewitness evidence of words murdered. Mr. Culver, what is your regiment? When were you captured and brought to Andersonville? I was connected with the 15th Wisconsin Infantry, and I was captured and brought to Andersonville in March, 1864. Did you see a prisoner of war killed inside the stockade? I did. Who killed him? The guard. Did the guard do so on his own or by direct order? He was given a direct order to kill him. By whom? By Captain Wirt. And where did this take place? At the deadline. And who did you see killed? We called him Chickamauga because he'd lost a leg in that battle and because he'd lost his memory there. So we called him by that name, Chickamauga. And why did Chickamauga want to cross the deadline? He wished to lie down under a pine tree, he said, because a long time ago, not that he could remember where, he had laid down under a pine tree. I can't remember nothing before Chickamauga is what he told the guard. State the circumstances. When did this occur? It was in the... Early fall, I believe. I remember the smell of burning leaves. Please continue. I watched Chickamauga go toward the deadline, and I called to him to stop, but he went on as if not hearing. At the line, he shouted for the sentry to let him across, but the sentry waved him back. Then Chickamauga began to move up and down the line, hopping back and forth on his one leg and begging to be let out of the stockade just for 10 minutes. The guard let him stay on the line, but he was nervous and telling Chickamauga to get back. And Chickamauga laughed. And then Chickamauga, he said for the guard to tell Captain Wirtz that he knew of a plot whereby all the men would escape and that he'd tell the captain about that plot in exchange for being let out a few minutes. And with that, the guard sent for the captain to come, and Wirtz came. And when he saw Wirtz, Chickamauga made the captain promise to let him rest for a few minutes underneath that pine tree if he told him about that plot. And the captain said he'd do that. Then Chickamauga said, all right, I'll tell you about that plot. Here it is in a nutshell. Well, you know Uncle Billy Sherman in his white socks is marching through Georgia, and what he's going to do is blast Andersonville open from the outside, and that's how the men will get free. <laughs> and Wirtz began to rave, and he said to Chickamauga, I'm going to give you a pass to hell. <laughs> Chickamauga said, you can't give me no pass to hell on account I'm in hell now. <laughs> and then Wirtz turned to the guard and said, get that man back across the line or shoot him. And the guard said, I can't shoot no cripple. And Wirtz said, if you don't obey me, I'm going to have you court-martialed. And the next thing, the guard shot Chickamauga, and he fell over the deadline, done for. <laughs> That'll be all. Oh, Mr. Culver, I, I'm thinking of how accurately you told that story, but you remember the details down to the exact words, back and forth. And that sense of detail makes you a most excellent witness, Mr. Culver. Thank you, sir. And one might add, it's also a characteristic of a good soldier, which I'm sure you were before Andersonville. Before Andersonville? When you were in the line. In the line. Antietam Bridge and Chancellorville and Stafford Courthouse. You must remember those nighttime bivouacs. 
Around the fires, listening to those sentries. Around the fires, hearing them calling through the dark, all is well. Post one to post two, all is well. Of course, that outpost line, that was a line that no man dare cross on the pain of, of being shot by those sentries. On pain of being shot by the sentries. And who goes there is a cry. Who goes there? Who goes there? And of course, you can tell us why such lines were set up by their commanding officers, Mr. Culver, as you remember it, sir, by the book. By the book, yes, sir. And that is for the order and safety of the camp. And inside the stockade at Andersonville, there were signs posted there warning men not to cross that dark deadline. I recall some. Yes, Counsel, there were. Now, Mr. Culver, when... <laughs> oh, I... I, was... I was just thinking of that story you told about Chickamauga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sure with the, the great interest that, that people have in anecdotes about the water there, you're... Well, you've undoubtedly had an occasion to tell that story many times already, haven't you? I have been requested to tell it a oh. number of times. Oh, I'll, I'll wager you could tell it a, a hundred times and it would come out exactly as you told it here today. A thousand times, counsel, it'd come out the same way. Oh, and, and usually with, with great effect, I'm sure. With great effect, <laughs> yes, sir. But it would hardly be as effective if Captain Wirtz didn't come out the villain of the piece, would it? <laughs> well, hardly. <laughs> You wish to make a fool of me, Counsel. I'm not lying. No, you are not, Mr. Cole. A man can't help it if fables grow in his head, can he? No, he... Fables? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm looking for facts. And I'm hunting for them through fairy tales of good and evil. Mr. Culver, you say you heard Captain Wirt say, get that man back across the line, I shoot him! Didn't Captain Wirtz actually say, for God's sakes, get that man back across the line, or you will have to shoot him? It is frozen into my memory as I have said it. And when Chickamauga said, I'm in hell now, didn't Wirtz say, you and I both? You and I both are in hell, as indeed they were. I have said it as I remember it. As you need to remember it, Mr. Culver. No more questions, thank you. Move to dismiss on all counts under this specification since that deadline was a proper military line required for the order and safety of that camp. It was not a purely military line, Mr. Culver. Come over here. Take a look at this map. Here. Well, the stream enters the west wall of that camp. What was the water like there? It was somewhat fast flowing, yes. Well, was sir. it drinkable? Somewhat drinkable, and yes. Here, that man here. Here, by the deadline. What was the water like there? Not fitting to drink, no, no sir. No, by that time it was filthy and clogged with waste matter, wasn't it? Driving the men to do what? To try for a drink near the waste wall. Yes, and to get to that water, they had to wade waist deep through the to the swamp. Didn't waist they? deep and further. And once they succeeded in getting to that water, what did the guards do? To open fire on us. Killing them. Killing and wounding. Killing and wounding men for a drink of water, and worse knew that let those men get shot down. And council calls it a purely military line. Move to deny defense motion as to that deadline. In that it was clearly part of the cold, inhuman design of that cat. Inhuman? Yes. Immoral? Yes, I can. Well, a yes. judge advocate openly and finally admit his belief that Captain Wirtz's duty was a moral and not a military choice. A human choice! This arguing over an irrelevant issue becomes intolerable. Parties are warned. Defense motion is denied. Now. Will the judge advocate state the connection between the moral issue and the charge of conspiracy? The judge advocate. 
will not attempt to make that connection. Thank you, Mr. Culver. You may stand down. Well, if the uh, judge advocate has concluded, we'll adjourn until tomorrow, at which time the defense will be ready. We may wish to ask for further witnesses. If so, there'll be witnesses bringing in new criminal evidence. I say new criminal evidence in the precise legal meaning of that term, bearing directly on the charge of conspiracy. I hope that's understood, Colonel. Yes, sir. This court's a jerk. Tell me, Colonel, how does your role in this room differ from Wurtz's at Andersonville? You compare me to him? You know in your heart you condemn him for carrying out the orders of his military superiors. But this court will have no part of that argument. And what then do you do but withdraw it? You obey as Wurtz obeyed. Oh, of course, you're governed by much purer motives. Let's forget about the fact that you're in a position to walk out of this case the envy of every young struggling lawyer in the country, the successful prosecutor of the one war criminal to be hanged out of this war. Your career is assured if you don't jeopardize it. Shall then the government's own counsel go out and preach disobedience to orders? <laughs> How's it feel to be an instrument of policy and nothing more? God damn you. Get as angry as you wish. But that's the truth of it. Good afternoon, gentlemen. You see what he's trying to do? I see. He's trying to provoke you. I know. I shout at you. I shout at Davidson. Only a boy, a sick boy. Well, where do we stand after days of witnesses on the stand? Sick, broken survivors of that place. We haven't proven criminal acts. What kind of a case do we bring in here? Well, if uh, you want a better one... Uh, Close with Gray. He saw Wurtz commit murder. You heard Gray. Do you believe him? Let the court decide. Gray furnishes the name of the murdered man. His name? Regiment. What's the difference in the end, Chipman? Wurtz is doomed anyway. The kind of case we bring in doesn't really matter, does it? No, not really. And if we believe that Wurtz should have disobeyed to save those men... Hmm. We're afraid to raise the issue. They could have reached you. But are we any better than he was at Andersonville? Or has Baker raised an issue that's been in this case from the beginning? One that we haven't wanted to face. We don't need to face it. I'll say it again. What is doomed? No matter how our case looks, now you can make it hard for yourself if you want to by turning it the wrong way. But you're a soldier, Chipman, and you know how this army has to function if it functions at all. It has ways of dealing with irregulars. You seem to want to go a hard way. <laughs> I want to go a hard way. This blood spattered country. Skulls bleaching in the under the sky, the 
dead of my own Iowa second. Names you wouldn't know. Did any of us want to go a hard way? But we did. We did. As if we had any choice. As if I have any choice here. I asked for this case feeling hard against them. Hating them enough to want to flog them to words. Do you think I want to shed that hatred? Understanding what Baker wants me to do, to lock me in a quarrel with this government. I can't go around that. I hate that damn Southern cause. I still can't go around that issue. I'm partisan to my bones, and I still can't go around what Baker says. I'd like to believe that I'm more of a man than Wirtz was, that I would have disobeyed to save those men. But am I more of a man than he was? Either I press the court to consider the issue of Wirtz's moral responsibility to disobey, or I'm no better in my mind than he was. And I can't go around that. Just how would you raise your moral issue? I don't know. <laughs> Get Baker to put words on the stand. What you won't do? Put Gray on. You don't have to like him. Put Gray on the stand. Neil, his case down with a clear statement of murder, and you have your man, even if it isn't in your way. Government has a point to make too, you know. It struggles to pull together a divided country. Now, isn't that a worthy and important thing? <laughs> At least as important as the purity of your soul. Hosmer. Larger issues than a man's own convictions, aren't they? Sometimes. You make me feel old. At ease. This military court is now in session. <clears throat> what is the pleasure of the judge advocate? If the court please, on the specification that the defendant committed murder by his own hand, we call to the stand Sergeant James S. Gray. Sergeant James S. Gray. If the court please, we do not see that name listed here. Sergeant Gray's name is not listed because it was uncertain that his release from duty could be arranged in time. He's attached to General Thomas's headquarters in Nashville. No objection. Witness may be sworn in. You solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, sir. Sergeant Gray, what is your regiment? 7th Illinois Cavalry, Company B, sir. How long have you been in the service? My last term, two years, one month. How long were you in Andersonville prison? I was taken to Andersonville 10th of June, 1864. I remained there until November. Do you know anything about the defendant Wirtz having killed a man there at any time? Yes, sir. He shot a young fellow named William Stewart, a private, belonging to the 9th Minnesota Infantry. State the circumstances. Stewart and I went outside the stockade with a dead body. Explain we how you could get out. The regulations were that whenever a man died, prisoners could be detailed to take the dead body out past the gate to the dead house. Continue. Well, sir, I begged for a chance to move that dead body, and I was picked along with Stuart to take it out. We went up to the main gate with the body, and they passed us through with a guard. 
It was my determination. I don't know whether it was Stewart's or not, but it was my determination to try to make an escape again. We went toward the dead house, not to put the body in the dead house, because in that house they were piled like cordwood, full to the top, and a line of dead bodies extended from it for about 50 yards. Wirtz rode up and dismounted, asked us what we were doing out there. Stewart replied we'd brought out a dead body to be placed in the dead house. Wirtz said it was a lie. We were out there trying to make our escape. Stewart said it was not so. We were out there for the purpose stated. Wirtz said, if you say that again, I'll blow your brains out. Stewart repeated what he said before. Wirtz struck him down, stopped him, drew his revolver, shot him dead. Sergeant, is that the man? Yes, sir. Look close, Sergeant. Make sure. I give you the chance to take back that lie before the great God judges you. You knocked him down, you shot him dead. That'll be all. We would like a moment to confer with the defendant. We have no preparation for this witness. We you, Greg? Greg, who is Greg? <laughs> It is no use. Who is Greg? I don't know. What about William Stewart? There was no Stewart. Are you sure? Yes, yes, yes. I am sure. Sergeant, would you uh, describe once again this so-called Stewart step? Words rode up, asked us by what authority we were out there. Stewart replied we were out there by proper authority. So Captain Words knocked him down and then shot him simply because he said he was out there by proper authority? Whether he shot Stewart because he said that or because he was a Yankee, I don't know. I don't know why he shot Stewart. But that's all Stuart said to him. There were some guards about at the time when this so-called murder occurred, were there not? I recall some. Did you uh, speak to them after Stuart was killed? I never spoke to Johnny Reb if I didn't have to. How well did you know Stuart? We were on the same prison squad. And under what circumstance did he oblige you with his name and his regiment? I don't recall exactly. Well, then... Describe this William Stewart. All looked alike. They're thinned out, not to be recognized by their own mother. So you can't describe him. Yet you talk with him, you know his name and his regiment, but you can't describe him. What did he do, hide his face when he talked with you? Oh, I know. Thinned out, and not to be recognized even by their own mothers. Well, then, can you refer to some third person who might be able to identify this William Stewart? No. No? What does that add to me, no? There were 90 men in that prison squad with you and Stuart and other men. At least one must have known he was with the 9th Minnesota and could identify him. Counsel, he just happened to mention his name and regiment to me. However, fortunately for the prosecution, which until now has lacked for a clear criminal instance, it has dredged you up as the single witness to a murder of a man having at least a name. Sergeant, do you believe in the afterlife? And do you believe that a man sins, including the sin of lying, will there be punished? I believe there is such a thing as punishment after death. Have you ever been arrested for a criminal offense? No, sir. I take it you like the army, Sergeant, seeing as you have re-enlisted? I would say that. After all, the army feeds you, makes you comfortable, and judging from your sergeant's stripes, you are considered by your military superiors to be a good soldier. One who knows what he is supposed to do without it being explained to him in so many words. A man gets to know what's expected of him. And if you felt, even if you weren't told what was expected of you, you'd carry that out, wouldn't you? Certainly. And if you felt, even if you weren't told what the Army's real concern was in, in some situation, and if you understood that to mean that you were supposed to lie, you would lie. Mr. Baker, you finish your question along that line, you'll be in contempt. Withdrawn. Sergeant, what did you do before entering the Army? I farmed some ran dogs. Ran dogs? Uh, hunting, so forth. Well, what'd you do that work? Illinois, Indiana, Virginia. Virginia? Virginia? For what purpose did you run your dog pack in Virginia? Was it by any chance to bring back runaway slaves? Yes, sir. I take it was more profitable to, to track down runaway slaves in Virginia than it was to go hunting deer in Indiana. Well, being a Negro was valuable property that had to be brought back alive. Tell me, Sergeant, 
Did that valuable property ever ever make human sounds when you caught it? Did it ever beg you to let it go find freedom? I don't remember. Human feelings must be put aside sometimes, mustn't they? And the truth must be put aside sometimes, too. And when you say you saw Captain Word shoot a man named Stuart at Andersonville, you were lying! Words! I saw that happen as I have described it. That'll be all. Where are you lying? When you said you saw Wirtz kill a man named Stuart. I saw that happen as I have described it. Did you see Wirtz kill a man named Stuart? Or did you hear something about it? I saw that happen as I have described it, sir. That'll be all. Witness may step down. Has the uh, judge advocate finally concluded his case? And is the defense ready? Yes, sir. Since defense regards the instance of murder alleged against the defendant as the single charge worth refuting... Baker, the court is not interested in your judgment of the charges. We shall waive the entire list of our witnesses and in their place call to the stand one witness. One witness. Questioning will only take a few minutes and it will constitute the entire defense case. Yes, well, who is the witness? He's in the room, Dr. Ford, physician in charge at the old Capitol Jail where the defendant has been lodged since the trial began. Let Dr. Ford take the stand. You, sure? this is only one of us. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give to this court on the issue now depending between the Republic and the prisoner at the bar shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Dr. Ford, you have for some time past now been in the habit of seeing the defendant. Yes, sir, since uh, June, I believe, ever since his imprisonment. He's been under my care when sick. And have you during that time examined the defendant's right arm, and have you examined him today? Yes, sir. What do you find the condition to be of his right arm? It's swollen and inflamed, ulcerated in three places. Has the appearance of having been broken. And the fingers of his right hand? Two fingers, the little finger and the next, are slightly contracted. The contraction is due to injury of the nerve leading down to the fingers. And have you examined the defendant's left shoulder? Yes, sir. A portion of it is dead. There's a very large scar on the left shoulder, and a portion of the deltoid muscle is entirely gone. I suppose from his war wound. It's just been carried away. Only the front part of the muscle remains. And doctor, how would that affect the strength in that arm? Well, he might be able to strike out with the forearm from the elbow, but he could not elevate the whole arm. Now, as to his right arm, would he be capable of pushing or knocking a man down? No, I should think he'd been capable of doing so with either arm, without doing himself great injury. Would he be capable, using with any force a heavy or a light instrument, would he be capable of pulling the trigger, let alone suffering the recall of a heavy revolver? No, not likely. And as to his condition a year ago in 1864? Uh, I've spoken with uh, Dr. Bates, who was at Andersonville, and who examined Mr. Wirtz there at the defendant's request. And he agrees with my opinion that this condition was no better in 1864 than it is today. So that he could not have knocked down the so-called William Stewart. I don't see how. He could not have pulled the trigger. Well, as I've he said... He could not have killed him. The defense rests. Thank you. Colonel? Uh, Colonel Chipman, uh, will the judge advocate cross-examine? Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford has testified to Mr. Wirtz's medical condition as he sees it. And we're not here to dispute medical facts. There's no cross-examination, but... Thank you, Dr. Ford. What is it? 
Is it all finished? B but I have not had the chance. We will convene the day after tomorrow to hear government and defense summations. Yes, please, Mr. we would like to ask for a continuance. Does the judge advocate wish to bring forward new evidence? It's possible. We'd like to ask for a continuance until tomorrow morning. It's possible that there is something more pertinent to this trial. Well, that perhaps the defense would welcome new evidence? Absolutely. Particularly on the charge of violent murder attributed to a man who can't even raise his arms. Unless the government contemplates other witnesses, we must consider that the presentation of evidence is finished. If it please the court, we do not feel that the situation at Andersonville has been sufficiently explored. That is why we ask for a continuance. If there is more to be said, more to be discovered about what took place there. I agree, yes. For once, I agree with the judge advocate. Does the defendant wish to take the stand on his own behalf? What? No! What is that? The defendant will not take the stand! He's legally bound to do so, but he may wish to make his position clearer. More clear. Now, what is that? The judge has been able to do more. He addresses the witness over the head of counsel. That I might make my position clearer. You cannot speak, Mr. Wirtz, unless you take the stand. The judge advocate is asking if you want to take the stand. You have a right to do so, but you can't be compelled to do so. You have that right. So we suggest you listen to counsel. Right? Are you out of your mind? I don't understand what's come over you. This legal game has been played back and forth, and I am to die. Without a word to say for myself, I must explain. Now listen. The evidence against you, they've got, is tainted from the start to finish, and they know that. Let them bring in their verdict of guilty, but then it must go to the president who may pardon, as he values the reputation of the government, and that is your single chance. And I say no chance, no chance. Willis, listen to Baker. You will not take that stand. I was a man like other men. I wish to show that. But you will face Chipman alone, and you will be alone. Do you understand that, alone? Yes, alone, as I had been alone. Neither you nor anyone here has been concerned with me as a man. And I, I might wish to speak, since the judge advocate wishes me to take the stand. Mr. Wirtz, the judge advocate cannot influence you to do that. He's not your counsel. Well, of course he is not. He is my worst enemy. Oh, I know that he wishes to destroy me. <laughs> take the stand on my own behalf. Uh, on your own behalf. Are you dispensing with counsel, Captain Wirtz? You may take the stand and speak for yourself, Mr. Wirtz, but afterwards, I warn you, I will try to search you out to the bottom of your soul. Ha! You think you can do that? I can try. Will the defendant state whether or not he wishes to take the stand? <laughs> General! <laughs> Did you hear that? My worst enemy, what does he say? He will search me out to the bottom of my soul. Captain Wirtz. Captain Wirtz! Oh. Do you think the Chipman is here to save you? Well, I am to die. I must take the stand. I have been made a monster in the eyes of my children. I die with that mark on me if I do not speak out, and I will not have it that way. I will give them my word so that they can say their father was a man, not other men. We won't stand. You will examine, but then I will fight him. And if you take that stand, how do I stop you from saying more than you should? But don't you understand, Baker? I must fight him. I must fight him. The defendant will take the stand on his own behalf. Uh, Mr. Baker, he understands that he is not required to do so. Oh, he understands and he wishes to do so. Very well, Mr. Wirtz. You may take the stand. <coughs> you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give to the court in the issue now depending between the Republic and the prisoner at the bar shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. <coughs> Captain Wirtz, you are a naturalized citizen of the United States. Is that correct? Yes, sir. When and where were you born? I was born in Zurich, Switzerland in the year 1822. And in what year did you arrive in the United States? In 1849. Would you state briefly your activities prior to the outbreak of the war? So I worked at first <clears throat> in the mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts. I'm not doing well there. Moved with my family to various parts of the United States. I 
resided for a while in uh, Louisiana and lived in Louisville, Kentucky, when the war broke out. You now state your war record prior to your assignment as superintendent of the Anderson prison camp. So I enlisted in the services of, a, of the Confederacy as a private and was soon commissioned as a lieutenant, having had previous military training abroad. After being wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines, I was offered that assignment of superintendent by General Weinberg. And over what period of time did you serve in that assignment? From January 1864 until February of this year. Captain Wirtz, during that time, were you given any special or secret instructions as how to run that camp? No, sir. I refer specifically, sir, to the instructions of the care of the prisoners. Uh, no, sir, no special instructions. Beyond the prescribed regulations for the care of prisoners of war, and any statement to the contrary is... Captain Wirtz! Were the food supplies that first furnish you sufficient for those prisoners? Yes, sir. At first, I received ample supplies to furnish for each and every enemy prisoner a ration which was the same ration issued to Confederate soldiers, as is the custom. It included bacon, fresh baked bread daily. Hey, if not bacon, there was beef, and those men did not starve. But later, Captain. it became... Captain. Captain. Oh. Did you now state the circumstances under which that situation changed? You see, it began to change for the worse around March when we began to receive prisoners by the thousands, but not sufficiently an increase in the ration. So naturally, I had to more and more cut down the ration. And I wrote to General Weiner about that. Yes, when, Captain, when did you write to General Weiner? Well, sometime in May 1864. I have here a letter written by Captain Wirtz to General Weiner. Dated May 26, 1864. Presented to the court. Maybe I... And for the defense. Letter of May 26, 1864. Entered as evidence for the defense. Captain, would you now tell us about that letter? Yes, sir. I wrote to General Weiner complaining about the lack of food and requested additional supplies. And, Captain, did General Weiner reply to that letter? So he did so on one of his visits to the camp. He said, we were taking care of the prisoners just as well as the enemy took care of our men in their hands. He said that our men were not well treated, especially at the camp in Elmira, New York, where they were dying like flies. He was in a temper. He made it clear that closed the subject. And as an inferior officer, I felt I could not pursue the matter further. But, I did what it was in my power to do there, as, as about the drummer boys. Yes, the... yes, Captain. We will get to that in a moment. Did you now tell the court the origin of the deadline? Yes, as to the deadline. Mm -hmm. In the conversation, I said to General Wine that the prisoners were getting desperate because of the lack of food and the guards consequently nervous, fearing a rush on the walls, and there was bound to be trouble. I asked for more guards to quiet the prisoners down with a short strength, but he said that the men could not be spared. But still, it was my responsibility they should not escape, don't you see? So, I suggested that inner line. And General Weinder approved that line. But that does not mean that I did not consider those men, as I started to say before, about the drummer boys. Very well, uh, very well. Tell the court about those drummer boys. So there were 60 or 70 boys in the camp. Drummer boys, little bits of boys. And I felt bad that those boys should suffer there, having children of my own. So I asked them if they would take an oath not to try to escape, and they did. <laughs> and they were allowed on parole outside the gate. And they lived outside the camp. I assigned them to pick blackberries to furnish additional food for the camp, but... Uh, that did not work out. Being boys, they ate what they picked themselves. <laughs> I, I, that was not all that I did. Captain, would I, you now, would you now tell us about Father Whelan? Uh, yes. Uh, I allowed all religious people of any denomination to enter that camp, and Father Whelan of the Roman Catholic Church came there several times, bringing fresh bread there. He was allowed to do that. 
and he distributed to all the prisoners, black and white. All of these people of any denomination were permitted to enter that camp and bring comfort to the prisoners all. all. I believe that religion, oh, that religion is yes, one Captain, of... Yes, Captain, Captain, would you now tell us about the women who tried to bring food to that camp? Yes, yes. At first, General Einder graciously consented to let that food be brought in. But when the women were about to do that, he received some bad war news, some report that Sheridan was burning farmhouses and crops in the Shenandoah Valley. And he flew into rage, and he said that the food could not be brought in. And as an inferior there, I could hardly override his orders. Huh? Huh? And that is how it was, yes. In general, that place was entirely on my head. And did you try to get relief, Captain? I have not finished. As I was saying, in general, that place was entirely on my head. I had the responsibility to give order and to keep those men from escaping, and they kept trying, and it was difficult to keep order since the men kept trying. Naturally, they had that right to try. And I had my duty, which was to prevent them. But you did try to get relieved of that assignment, did you not, Captain? Yes, I wrote to General Einder asking to be assigned to another post, but he informed me that I could not be relieved and simply I had there to stay. I simply, and so it, it kept being on my head. I have here a letter written by the defendant to General Winder dated May 19th, 1864, in which he requests to be relieved of his assignment. His Submitted post. for the defense. It may be ended. Exhibit 10 for the defense. Letter of May 19th, 1864, office for the defense. Now, oh, Captain Wirtz, did you strike down or kill a man called William Stewart? <laughs> there was no William Stewart, and that is a lie. Uh, there was no William Stewart. Did you at any time shoot down or kill a prisoner of war? No, sir, I never did that. I could not physically do that. And when you were arrested at the conclusion of those hostilities, were you making an attempt to escape? <laughs> no, sir. I had no reason to do that. I was standing outside the stockade with my family, and having heard of the general pardon, <laughs> was on my way back to Louisville when a major of oh, General Merritt's forces entered to tell me that I was under arrest. I was taken away and held prisoner, and I soon understood the awful charge against me and that my fate was to hang. That will be all, thank you. Am I not to be asked my conception of my duty? That will be all, Captain. I wish to explain how I understand the military rules. Very well. Explain your understanding of the military code. That one does as he is ordered. That he keeps his feelings to himself. That he does not play the heroic game that some people who are not in his position think he could play. That he obeys. That he does not concern himself with the policies of his superiors, but obeys. That he does his assigned job and obeys. That when the order to charge is given, he obeys. That when ordered to keep prisoners, he obeys. And if in so doing he must die, then he dies. Your witness, Colonel. Mr. Wirtz, you've explained your sense of duty very clearly. When an officer is ordered to keep prisoners, he obeys. Yes, sir. Meaning he must keep them from escaping. That is one of the things, yes. Well, meaning he must keep them alive? <laughs> in so far as it is within his power. Which did you consider more important, keeping them alive or keeping them from escaping? According to the customs of war, to keep them alive as it was within my power and to prevent them from escaping. One duty more nor less important in your mind? Both equal. You say you never at any time killed a prisoner of war. 
It has been demonstrated that I could not. I ask you, sir, directly. Did you or did you not? No, sir, I never did that. In your letter of May 26, 1864, in which you tell General Winder of your increasing duties at Andersonville, I note you also ask him to consider you for a promotion in rank from captain to major. What were you concerned with when you wrote that letter, the promotion or the overcrowding? There's nothing wrong in the same letter to request that promotion. And uh, in your letter requesting the transfer, you make a point of your illness as the reason. It's to, to make it indirect. Otherwise, General Einder might not have liked the transfer request. All the same, you do request medical attention, do you not? Yes, I had in mind at the same time to get away from that assignment. You say what happened at Andersonville was beyond your power to avert? Yes, sir. In the course of performing your duties, you would make an inspection of the stockade from time to time, I imagine, from the walls where the guards stood. You could look down into that. How would you describe it, sir? It has been described. As a sort of hell? Oh, indescribable, sir. Indescribable. I hope you will remember, Colonel, hearing me say that I could not bear the sight of those young boy prisoners in there, and 60 or 70 of them I sent them out to pick, to pick black blackberries. Yes, yes, that's in your favor. Thank you, sir. It's interesting to note that you keep referring to that act as though there's so much else you dare not remember. You twist things, sir. I let Father Whalen bring bread. You would go to your duties every morning from your home? Hmm? Yes, sir. And uh, you were concerned with raising your children in the normal fashion, you were teaching them the common virtue, did you not? Particularly in a religious way, yes. You saw nothing strange in leaving your family and your grace at meals and going to your job overseeing the dying of men. Objection. Withdrawn. You've said that keeping those men alive was of equal importance in your mind with keeping them from escaping. Yes, sir. The food was wormy and rotten. Did you think of sending foragers out? to commandeer supplies from the Georgia farmers. It would have been illegal for me to do so, sir. Signed vouchers? I was not authorized. Paid for by the Confederacy? Not authorized, sir. Could have sent out squads of prisoners to collect firewood. Who would escape? Under guard. There were not enough guards. Enlarge the stockade. The size was prescribed. Let those prisoners, among whom were carpenters, masons, mechanics of all types, Build shelters that would have kept those men alive. As I have said, not authorized. But those measures would have saved lives. I do not know how many. Oh, well, we'll say just one! Would you say just one single human life is precious, Mr. Wirtz? I do not follow. It would have been illegal for me to do the things you say. But morally right. Objection. Yes, the court must agree. The judge advocate's questioning does not connect with the charge of conspiracy. If the court please, if I may explore this issue one step further before deciding the connection cannot be made. You may explore it, Colonel, one step further. You're a religious man, Mr. Woods. As I have said, I... No, how uh, important religion is, I allowed all ministers of... Any denomination. Professing religion as you do, will you agree that the promptings of conscience, moral considerations, are primary to all men? Of course I do. I observe that I deal like most men when I can. When you can, and you could not observe moral considerations at Andersonville. That situation was General Winder's responsibility, not mine. Uh, this was General Winder's responsibility because he was your military superior? 
Yes, sir. How far over you did you deem his authority to extend? To all circumstances, considering that was a military war situation. To all circumstances? You're certain of that? I am absolutely certain. And had General Winder in this military war situation given you a direct order to slaughter one of your own children without an explanation, would you have done it? <laughs> it is ridiculous. <laughs> would you have done it? <laughs> it is ridiculous. Would you have done it? Sir, no. Why not? It would have been an insane order. Yes, insane. Or inhuman or immoral. And a man does indeed, therefore, in his heart, make some inner judgment as to the orders he obeyed. Well, the judge advocate will hold. This court has stated more than once it is not disposed to consider the moral issue relating to soldierly conduct. It has indicated to the judge advocate that we are on extremely delicate ground at any time that we enter into the circumstances under which officers may disobey their military superiors. However, the Judge Advocate apparently now feels he must enter that area. He will furnish some legal basis to this court, or he will withdraw this line of questioning. If the court please, I will the endeavor to... The Judge Advocate must furnish a legal basis. The, the Judge Advocate respectfully... This court urges... will hear a basis for permitting this line of inquiry. The court please. Military courts, judging war crimes, are governed by both the criminal code and a broader, more general code of universal international law. In most cases that come before them, they will judge the specific acts in which the nature and the degree of offense is determinable without great difficulty. But on rare occasions, cases occur demanding from the court a more, a more searching inquiry. And should the court allow that broader inquiry, it becomes more than just a court of record on a particular case. It becomes a supreme tribunal willing to peer into the very heart of human conduct. The judge advocate respectfully urges that the court does not in advance limit or narrowly define the basis of questioning should the court insist on such a basis. We are through with the witness. Well, does the uh, judge advocate offer this court alternatives? Oh, no, sir, we did not mean to imply that. You know, you know we are very flattered to think that uh, we may take on the mantle of a, a supreme tribunal. However, it is still a military court. If the court please. No, Colonel, I'm not through. Now, the court grants that, that it may be philosophically true that men have the human right to judge the commands of their military superiors. But, Colonel, in practice, one does so at his peril. At his peril, yes, sir. And we would want that the peril of that line of question, that it be clearly understood, most clearly. Now, we have a question for the judge advocate, which he may or may not answer, since he, of course, is not on trial here. <coughs> the question is, what is it an honest man fights for? when he takes up arms for his country? Is it the state or the moral principle inherent in that state? And if the state and the principle are not one, is he bound not to fight for that state and indeed to fight against it? Now, the judge advocate needs an answer. We'll, we'll make the question more particular. <clears throat> if, if at the outbreak of the war, the government of the so-called Confederacy had stood on the moral principle of freedom for the black man, and the government of the United States had stood for slavery, would a man have been bound on moral grounds to follow the dictates of conscience, even, even if it had led him up to the point of taking up arms against the government of the United States? It's inconceivable. That's not the question. Well, such a situation and that possible. is not the question. He would be bound to follow the dictates of his own conscience. Colonel, e even to the point of taking up arms against the government of the United States? Yes, sir. <sighs> well, the Colonel understands, of course, that a man must be prepared to pay the penalties involved for violating the, uh, well, let us say, the code or the group to which he belongs. Now, in other societies, that has meant death. In our society, it can merely mean deprivation of status, uh, contempt of his fellows, exile in the midst of his countrymen. Uh, 
Well, I take it the Colonel understands my meaning. He understands what the court is saying. And you still feel? He still feels that he must enter this most dangerous area. General, I do not enter on my own free will. I, I enter because I'm forced to it by the very nature of this case. We have lately emerged from a terrible and bloody war, and this war has spawned a very curious and sinister crime. Men in the thousands, 14,000 men have been sent to their death, not by bullets on the battlefield, but in a subtle, hidden, furtive fashion. We have, through the course of this trial, examined, as it were, the outward appearances of hell. The walls, the stockade, the swamps, the dogs, the terrible heat, the freezing cold, and, and we have not gotten to the heart of it. We are now faced with the necessity Exploring further into, let us say it again, hell. I put it to the court that we owe to those 14,000 men who died, to those who mourn them, something so true as to put us head and shoulders above politics, above sectionalism, above the bitterness in our own heart. I admit to entering this room with that bitterness in myself. I admit to that mood of vengeance. I wish. I wish now to go beyond that, if I can. As we say, life is precious, and as we cling to our humanity by our fingernails in this world, <coughs> by our fingernails. Let us have a human victory in this room. Colonel, the court is not unmoved. <clears throat> the <clears throat> judge advocate feels, considers, he feels it's primary to the presentation of his case, the moral issue of disobedience to a superior officer. Yes, sir. You may continue. Judge Advocate may continue. The judge Advocate may continue? Yes! <laughs> Defense counsel is amazed that this court does not now recognize the fact that there is no legal case here to try to connect normal obedience to orders with willful conspiracy is impossible. And no fine-sounding statements of Universal law or supreme tribunal can break the unbridgeable. And the court knows that the judge advocate cannot possibly make that connection. Yet the court allows the judge advocate to proceed when it should forthwith dismiss the defendant. Are you, Mr. Baker, ordering the court to do that? No. But he submits that there is no legal case here. The judge advocate may continue! And this court will decide when it will conclude that question when nothing more can be gained by it. Is that clear? Mr. Wirtz. Mr. Wirtz, we have said that a man does make an inner judgment as to the orders he obeys, which implies that if those orders offend his humanity deeply enough, he may disobey them. General Winder's authority over you was not absolute. The question is, why did you obey? I might have quite run, sir. I 
did not think of my assignment at Andersonville in that way. I didn't understand what happens here. I thought only in the normal way to obey him, since he was my military superior. Not your moral superior, sir. No man has authority over the soul of another. As we are men, we own our own souls, and as we own them, we are equal as men, sir. The general, the private, the professor, the hard carrier, we're equal as men, sir. And every man alive, being a man, knows that, as you in your heart knew that. And as this but situation that is had become an immoral, grossly immoral situation, and as General Winder was not your moral superior, you did not have to obey him. The question therefore remains, why did you obey him? Mr. Wirtz, the court would like to hear the answer. I will say it clearly. I would most certainly have been court-martialed. And if my superiors wish, considering that was a time of war and that war had come to a desperate, bitter stage in which the word traitor could be sounded in a moment, I might have been executed. But it might at least have been for a reason. You might have saved 14,000 men. Were you afraid, sir? I was so soldier afraid. Then the question still is, why did you obey? As I have said, <laughs> what a heroic thing do you demand? I should have done at Andersonville. I, an ordinary man like most men. Oh, Mr. Wirtz, we who are born into the human race are elected to an extraordinary role in the scheme of things. We're endowed with reason, Mr. Wirtz, and therefore personally responsible for our acts. A man may give to officials over him many things, but not his soul, sir, not what we call his immortal soul. And therefore the question still is, why did you obey? Why? As I have said, as I say for the last time, that was to me a military situation. But this was not a military situation. Those helpless, unarmed men were not the enemy. No matter what Winder said, this was no longer a question of North and South, a question of, of war, but a question of human beings. Chandler saw that. The women who tried to bring that food to those starving men, they saw that. What was your conscience then? Well, Did General Winder's pocket, along with his keys, his tobacco, and his money, and worth no more than any of those You things. speak high, Colonel, high. They are still here in this room. If they can say in their hearts they would have done different if they had been in my place, ask them. You are all the victors here, and you make up a morality for the losers. Yes, the victors make the morality for the losers, cannot. And I spit on that morality. I spit on it. And I say, ask them in this room if they would have done different. Huh? Ask them. And if they cannot, and we must shudder for the world we live in. For the prospect before us then is a world of Andersonville's. Of jailers concerned only with executing the, the commands of their masters, and freed of their conscience. Concerned only with the masters to whom they have lost their souls. Might not the jailer commit murder then? I did not commit murder. You did not kill William Stewart. There was no William Stewart. You were never in a fury with those men. A fury so famous to overcome the weakness in your arms. It is as the doctors say. To whom do you dare say that? You and I have been on the battlefield. We've seen men with the with, with the bones in their hands and with the legs broken. Still move forward. You moved those dead arms. No. You raised them. Yes. Yes, you did. You were in a fury when you rode out with those men. And when you caught them, you raised those two dead arms. No. Then how did you rein that hard mouth horse to the left? And how to the right? And how keep his head down when he reared, if not with those two? Possibly. I uh, raised my arm sometimes, yes. But I did not kill any William Stewart because there was no William Stewart, so help me God. We'll leave William Stewart aside. But you had to obey those orders that were killing men, didn't you? I had to obey. Even though you knew that to obey was to kill them. And to disobey was to save them. Even though 
simply I could not disobey. I did my duty as I saw it. I have made that clear. Then you badge him. Miss Holloway, I will explain it. It will not do for you. And you badger me. You badger, you badger me. I have made it clear that I had to keep order there. Hmm? To keep a record monthly of the number of prisoners, including those escaping, to report that to General Einder and to the War Department, and you badger me! It has been made clear, and you will not let go! To prevent them from escaping, hmm? to keep a record in writing of the attempted escapes, that was my responsibility. Isn't that clear? Huh? <laughs> Even though I have not enough men, that does, that does not excuse me. Though I have found that job overwhelming, isn't that clear that you battered me? It, it was. Overwhelming. <sighs> and I had to find ways and means to block those escape attempts. That was my duty. It was solely on my head. And so it went. I preventing, they trying. I preventing, they trying. And no move to stop them. Completely successful. Nothing, nothing could stop them. And the responsibility is solely mine. A dead land. <laughs> that, that, that could not prevent them. <laughs> Cannon mounted on the walls. It could not prevent them. Kept trying. Tunneling under the walls. Digging, burrowing, burrowing in the night. Burrowing. <laughs> Crushed by the weight of the wall timbers when they made the mistake to tunnel directly under those logs. And the others continuing, continuing, tucked under the dogs, trying again. And I have to anticipate finding the tunnels, learning the tricks. They trying, I preventing. They trying, I preventing. They <laughs> bribing the guards with greenbacks. <laughs> Blacking their faces to look like niggers to get the dead bodies out of the stockade. And I charge to block those moves. But nothing prevents them to try the boring. Hey, at night, I am awake. I do not need to see them to know what they are doing, boring in the night. Digging in the hopeless effort to escape, digging, crawling like rats. Like rats. And rats may die, and one may have no compunction about rats. Yes. Ah, ah, ah. I meant rats, so to speak. You, you, you are playing a cheap lawyer's trick on me. Very well, a cheap lawyer's trick, so they were not rats to you. But they were no longer men to you. In your mind, you had canceled them out as men, made them less than men. Then they might die. And one need not suffer over that needy. Why did you try to commit suicide in your cell? Was it because you feel nothing? Was it because you feel nothing as a human being and cannot endure yourself feeling nothing?
You speak too much of your children. Is it because you've already asked them in your mind? Should I have done my duty? Or should I have given the man a drink of water? And you have already heard their answer. <laughs> Yes, you wish to die. I ask you for the last time, Mr. Words, why? And it was not fear of dismissal or court martial or any external thing. Why? Inside yourself, couldn't you disobey? Simply, I could not. I did not have that feeling inside myself to do, 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 do that. I did not have that feeling of strength. Be able to. I could not disobey. rests. And on the charge that the prisoner did with others conspire to destroy the lives of soldiers in the military service of the United States in violation of the laws and customs of war guilty. And on the various specifications that he aided and abetted murder and did commit murder guilty. And the court did therefore sentence him the said Henry Wirtz, to be hanged by the neck till he be dead at such time and place as the President of the United States may direct two-thirds of the members of the court concurring therein. The business of this military court being now terminated, we declare this court dissolved. Well, I'll say this for you, Colonel. At least you fought on your own terms. I asked for his guilt, not his death. And he dies anyway. This is the life of the Union dead. Political verdict. I charged him for what he is. And who cares? I did. What's that got to do with the real world? Men will go on, most of them, subject to fears, and so subject to powers and authorities. How do we change that slavery? Well, it's of man's very nature. Is it? We try to redecorate the beast in all sorts of political coats, hoping that we will change him. But is he to be changed? I don't know. We try. <laughs> <laughs> 